Yo, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press. And our guest, the public affairs analyst, Mr. Ezekiel Nyeetuk, joins us now. Good morning, Mr. Nyeetuk. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be with you. Yes, thank you. Let's begin with the Punch newspaper this morning. The headline reads, Cash Crunch. NNPC writes, Governors, bloated revenue, bloated subsidy, eats up revenue. Corruption or corporation projects zero allocations for April, May, 12.9 billion naira for June. State governments intensify IGR drive, float industries and new airlines. Above the headline, Nigeria, six others, accounts for 65% global gas flaring. That's according to the World Bank. Senate demands explanation on 7.5 billion naira withdrawals from NSA, Amit. Federal Government, World Bank, meets over NBS confusing employment statistics. NAFDAQ, NERC, others opt for self-funding. Below the headlines on the Punch newspaper, slain Kaduna varsity students buried. Colleagues narrate night of horror. Osimbajo chairs panel to address worsening poverty. Assassins kill Lagos socialite month after chief Tansi case victory. Oyo Hotelia, wife, seven victims settle kidnappers and secures freedom. Four year sacks registrar over indictments for irregular recruitment. Lagos hands over amputee water hawker to NGO, 25 million naira raised. And we see a picture here of a funeral ceremony, and that must be of the slain Kaduna varsity students um, and the night of horror here on the Punch newspaper. All right, now to the nation newspapers. Uh, the big one there on your screen says, Nigeria can't afford another civil war, Oshimbajo warns. Uh, Arni Sultan caution against secession calls. Abari Bay says, government creating room for disintegration. Also this morning, INEC, delay of electoral bill passage threatens 2023 elections. Also, gunmen hit more police assets in attacks. Two policemen killed, hotelier and wife murdered. Uh, Lagos withdraws 25 million naira donation to amputee trader over false claims. That's a really sad story. We can also find on the nation this morning, NDLEA seizes drugs worth 80 billion naira in, 80, in 100 days. And um, we can also see here, NSAS panel asks Ondo to pay 755 million naira. Uh, Obasanjo is in the news this morning saying insecurity will end soon. Those are the big ones that we can find on the nation newspapers this morning. On The Guardian, growing concern as correctional facilities risk more jailbreaks. Over 3,000 escaped inmates on the loose. Overcrowding fueling jailbreak attempts. Experts link incidents to spike in crime rates. And uh, we see a story here saying, again, unknown gunmen raise Abia police station, kill two cops in Akwaibom. And below the headline on the Guardian newspaper, Nigeria will overcome its challenges, says Obasanjo Abiodun Makindi. Senate empowers Amcon to confiscate on unsended assets as collateral. FEC debates worsening poverty, OK's policy to mitigate menace, and NSIA saves $350 million from Presidential Fertilizer Initiative. All right, and now on the Daily Independent, INEC troubled over the <coughs> Electoral Act Amendment Bill passage, fixes general elections for February 18, 2023. Uh, we can also see here Senate and Powers AMCON to seize assets not used as collateral. Still on the Daily Independent, bandits attack Edo Senator's convoy twice injure policemen. Onez asks Buhari to probe attacks in Southeast, and also uh, FEC approves new policy framework to tackle poverty. Uh, I think these are the stories that we would uh, share on the Daily Independent. Good morning once again, Mr. Ezekiel Nyai Talk. There's a couple of uh, very yeah. interesting ones. Yes, please go yes, ahead. You were still talking. You said a couple of... 
Uh, I'll say there's a couple of very interesting stories. You can go ahead. Uh, let's uh, hear from you. Yeah, um, a lot. Uh, where I would like to start from, probably, is that of um, INEC. Um, several stories have come out as concerning what INEC said. A, a few days back, there was a round that INEC said there will be no electronic voting. And I was really concerned. So I happened to be privileged to have um, direct access to the chairman of INEC and a lot of other very um, important people. So I tried to get across to the chairman, which I couldn't, but I was able to get across to Mr. Igini, which I hold in very high esteem. And he did give very, very reassuring promises that such promises have to be within the ambit of the law. So he did tell me that the efforts that INEC was making to ensure that we have extremely credible elections. And there are certain things that we need to know at this point in time. One is that Mr. Mahmoud is not seeking a third term. He's not seeking a re-election. So he, he has his name on the line. He has his reputation on the line as an individual. Because a time comes when you need to draw a line between you're, you're representing an institution and you as an individual. Today, Mr. Jagger stands as an individual. Whatever were the seeds that he sowed during office, those are the things he's reaping now. And I think that the current uh, chairman of INEC has come to realize that he has his name, his reputation, his family, and God has divinely given him a place to write his name in history. So he can either just bungle that opportunity or hedge his name as the man that gave Nigeria the freest, fairest, and most credible elections. And he started, he took the first step at the you know, confirmation at the Senate. He could have played politics with it, but he hit it head on. And I was quite uh, impressed when he said, look, for us to have credible elections, we need to go electronic. That's it. And please, he was went ahead, followed it up by giving the inputs and everything for the Senate, the National Assembly, as it were, to pass a bill that will empower him to give a free, fair, credible election. And he is concerned that there is a delay in this process. Because, like you said when you were making your introductory remarks, at the beginning, Mr. President had said that Oh, we can't, uh, I can't sign this electoral bill right now because it is um, too close, you know, to, to elections. But then he's coming to office. Two, two years have passed. And we are inching towards the next two years of elections. And I think that Mr. President, just like we did on the budget, can call the National Assembly and say, please, this is one legacy I can bequeath this nation for him as an individual again. Because Mr. De, Mr. Mahmoud has a limit to which he can go. So for now, they are extremely reassuring. I want to tell Nigerians, you know, I, I wish we had the time, but we really don't have the time. But you see, there's, 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 there's something that politicians do. They know that they can't afford to compete with the best, a lot of them, most of them. Because I know there are some fine, excellent politicians senators, National Assembly members, even governors. But the generality, I say this with every sense of responsibility, can't, can't play on that level playing field. So what they're trying to do is hold on to a point and bring up narratives when the good people, because good people were starting to come out. They were starting to say, whoa, this makes sense. It's like we're going to have good elections. All of a sudden, they're starting to say, mm, are we really? And as a result, they're starting to go back. And the moment they start to retreat, the bad people would have won. So I want to I'll tell all Nigerians that, no, number one, from what I've heard from Mr. Igini, and I can, I can take his words to the bank. He's somebody I have a lot of respect for. From what I've heard from Mr. Igini, we are going to have not just credible elections, but they are introducing element that he's told me, where I cannot say it for now, that is going to make elections free, fair, credible. Okay. You know, there are certain things I can't bring out now, but I want to tell Nigerians, don't be flustered. They want you to lose hope. Don't lose hope. Okay. I'm happy that, uh, okay. 
All right, Ms. Ayetok, um, moving away from election matters, we're seeing a story here on the Punch newspaper which reads, Senate demands explanation on 7.5 billion Naira withdrawals from the NSA in Ahmed. And looking at the story, you know, it, it, the Senate says it discovered um, what it called secret withdrawals, you know, from the accounts of, you know, the CBN. And it says that they withdrew um, 3.7 billion Naira as loans to NAFCON, withdrew 3.8 billion Naira for security personnel car loan scheme, withdrew another 2.3 billion Naira uh, loan to Stairs Nigeria Limited. We know the Senate had asked these, you know, agencies, you know, summon them last week or two weeks ago, but they refused to, you know, you know show up. And uh, we're seeing now that the Senate is, you know, demanding an explanation uh, into these withdrawals and saying that the money must be returned. Um, what do you make of this story? <laughs> I will not go into the substance of the story because it's absolutely unnecessary. I will look at the kernel. I will look at the, the foundation, the backbone of the story. Is the Senate a toothless bulldog? Good On question. several occasions, what you realize is that the Senate invites the executive and they're like, excuse me. You know, on several occasions, they pass certain resolutions and they're like, excuse me. So the Senate is seemingly incapacitated. And you know, what happens is that if you go to a dog and he barks, you understand me, you, the first instinct is for you to run away. Until you discover that, oh, this dog is actually tied to a tree. So there's an extent to which you can go. So you can actually, and then you, you, you kind of examine the integrity of the chain. And you discover that it's a big tree and it's a real strong chain. You can actually go as close as possible to play with a lion. Because that lion can't do more than a dead rat. Okay? I think that the executive have, um, you know, tested the waters with the Senate and discovered that, oh, we pocketed this Senate. So we can, we, we, can, we can run away with blue murder, you know? Because the Senate that, that will be feared is a Senate that looks the executive in the eye and says, Sai, we've got to do the right thing. If you do the wrong thing, I'm going to impeach you. I'm going to bring you well, to vote. Um, and not, when sure the how. chief executive knows that he can be impeached, he will send a body language to all his subordinates and know that you guys better sit up. But when he knows that, even if he does anything, they'll say, sa, sa, say, baba, say, baba. Then the guy doesn't have, and when the, 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 the lieutenant discover that the boss cannot be taught, of course, it's like a child who is next to his father. He's going to tell you, come, 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 because he knows he's standing by the father. All right. Mm. Uh, let, let's go to um, the nation this morning. The vice president is quoted there saying, Nigeria can't afford another civil war. Um, and of course, uh, I think there was a writer to that story. That uh, well, um, Yes, and that's uh, from Ainaya Baribe saying, government creating room for disintegration. Um, Oni and Sultan caution against secession calls. So I want your reaction to what the vice president is saying. Nigeria can't afford another civil war. And of course, uh, you know, you, you can see the blame game going left and right as to who exactly is causing the divisions and, you know, creating the possibilities of a breakout of, of war. So uh, quickly react to that. Yes. Let me say this as, as, as frankly as I could. Number one, Nigerians wants to stay together. Number two, no Nigeria, no part of this country is willing to be taken for granted. The North respects the South. The South respect the north. It's a union of equals. Nobody is inferior. Nobody is subordinate. That's point number one. Number two is that people have woken up to realize that if we don't do something, you know, like a, one of my friends said, if you don't do something, something will do you. Okay? And as a result, they've realized that. Look, let me, you, you see, if you get into the Niger Delta, the creeks, and you see the stockpile of arms, ammunition, heavy weapons, not even light weapons, I'm told. You know, the, 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 the elders within the Niger Delta are realizing that if something happens, 
They need a backup. They need a protection. The same thing is happening in the southeast. The same thing is happening in the southwest because they think that there's a strategic plan for them to become second-class citizens, for them to be overrun. The moment that the president can step up and say, no Nigerian is more Nigerian than any Nigerian, like my sister Aisha says, that moment you realize that people will start to cool down. But for as long as there's this threat of being overrun by a certain ethnic nationality, for so long are we going to have each person waiting for the eventuality. And to that extent, what Mr. Vice President should say is look at any provocation from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west, and get the elders to sit together and talk and have a certain agreement. As of today, no part of this country can, around, can overrun the others. Yeah, but, I can but, say but, that but who, who do you say? Or what would you say has led to the divisive and, you know, the, the chaos, you know, that, you know, we're seeing between different tribes across the country? Uh, what would you I say will, has, will, has created all of that? I will hit this direct. I will hit this direct. People coming from outside this country thinking that Nigeria is a place that they can stay. You know, each time I have so many Fulani friends. And these guys, Nigerian Fulanis have become the victims. I'm very careful to say Nigerian Fulanis have become the victims because they have allowed silence of comrade, you know, tribe, tribesmen who are not Nigerians to come in. And these guys are ruthless. Nigerian Fulanis have been with us from time immemorial. They are there in my village. They are there everywhere. They are there shining shoes. They are nice guys. They are our megat. We trust them. We believe them. But there is another breed of Fulanis that are overrunning this country, and they are not Nigerian Fulanis. And what the Nigerian Fulanis, led by Mr. President, should do is to draw a line between tribesmen from other nations and nationality Nigerians. The moment he does that, he will protect his Nigerian Fulanis. If not so, these Nigerian Fulanis will be the worst victim because in the okay. southeast, those who will come in, the southeasterners will contain them. In the southwest, they will contain them. In the south south, they will contain them. It is in the north that the Nigerian Fulanis are going to be internally displaced. So the time has come for them to wake up and put their nation first and make that the Nigerian Fulanis, for instance, if I was the governor of a quiet home state, I'll be an Ibibio man. I'm not going to extend the budget of Akwaibom to Ibibios in, in, in Cross River. I'm not going to do that. Or to Ibibios in Apia. Or to Ibibios in, 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 in Rivers. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say we're Ibibio president. But guys, this is for Akwaibom Ibibios. And Mr. President needs to draw that line between Nigerian Fulanis and other Fulanis and shut the door against other Fulanis in Nigeria and protect Nigerian Fulanis and I am one of them that will stand up and say, our Nigerian brethren that are Fulanis must be accommodated, must be protected, because at the end of the day, mark my word, they will be the worst victims, because the arms and everything in Southeast, they are ready. South, South, they are ready. Southwest, they are ready. It is them that are calling, you know, it's like, it's like bringing a snake as a pet. One and then keeping with your child and he's playing with it. One day the snake gets angry. The next you come in, you discover that the snake has swallowed your child. All right, Mr. Yeah, snake talk. is a snake. All right, so um, the last story we'll be talk touching on today is from the Punch newspaper. And it's, it's a big story we'll also be discussing later on on the breakfast. It says, Cash Crunch. NNBC writes, governors bloated subsidy its revenue. Um, so basically, the NNPC here is saying that they may not be able to meet up with their revenue remittance for the month of May, and that you know they've been investing a lot into fuel subsidy, and the petrol per liter should actually cost you know over 200 naira, but they're doing a lot to subsidize that to um, just about 160 naira, you know thereabout. So now we know that uh, when we talk about the Federal Allocation Committee, um, the Federal Inland Revenue Service, the NNPC, you know these are the agencies that contribute much to this, you know. 
monies are now eventually disbursed to state governments. But they're saying for the month of May, their remittance to the FACC might be zero. How would this, you know, uh, how is this likely to affect the economy? You see, I, I'm one person that holds a very strong view on this question of subsidy. Because, you know, those who know my background, I came from nowhere. I understand poverty. I've lived with poverty. I lived with my grandmother in the village. That's where I was brought up. When you go to be brought up from, by your grandmother, that's like the bus, last bus stop. My parents tried, but they just, I understand what it means to wake up at 5 a.m. to go to the stream before you can go to the primary school. I understand what it means to sleep on the bare floor. I understand poverty. Let me tell you this, that subsidy is a scam against the poor. I will say this any day, any time. Why do I say so? Architect Nyaito, God has elevated him and blessed him to have five, ten SUVs because of the company that I run. Each of them is cons consuming over 20 uh, liters of fuel on even a journey. At the end of the day, I alone consume nothing less than 50 times the volume of fuel that the whole of my village consumes. Now you tell me about, oh, that guy that has to, you know, uh, empower him in another way, give him power, and he doesn't need to run his generator. Give him power. Look, imagine when they tell you that they are spending over a billion on a daily basis. I can't remember the exact figure. On a daily basis. Do you know what big one billion can do to my village? Now we have 360, you know, you know, 65 days. We have 700. That's like putting half a, a, a billion in, in, in all, uh, yes, a half a billion in each local government on a daily basis. They forget this rubbish called subsidy. I will tell you ways for you to, to mitigate, you know, the difference on the poor people. And then do target, you know, subsidy, things that will benefit the poor. Go okay. into what I call the fourth tier of government, where you make the world stances of development, All and right. you have direct allocation to the world, and you set up one government that is not paid for, but voluntary, and then let development take part in all the world at the same time. That is where the poor is. That is where the poor reside. That is where the poor will benefit. And then you are spending trillions on, on subsidizing the, 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 the affluence and, 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 the, and, 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 and the luxuries of the rich. Because right. how much fuel does a bike up. take in a day relative to what one SUV consumes in a day? Who are you, calling? Who are you subsidizing? You are subsidizing the, the, the rich. You are creating business for the rich at the expense of the poor. That's why you can't give them health care. You can't give them education. You can't give them power. Right. You can't give them anything. And you are telling me that you are subsidizing the poor. You are not. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning and for spending your Thursday morning with us. Yes, Truly appreciated. Thank you. All right, All stay right. with us uh, here on The Breakfast. There's a little bit more coming your actually a lot more coming your way. But after this short break, we're telling you what happened today in history. I'm yes. going back to the year 2006 and telling you about uh, the Niger Delta militants and something that they decided uh, to claim today. Stay with us. And then something light, you know, about a royal wedding in 2011.